Does that mean I'm going to... St- <laughs> it means you're on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this uh, <laughs> promises to become a, a whole thing today, but we'll see how it goes. I want you all to be comfortable. Um, we have a set of slides here that I'll try to go through um, pretty quickly. So we have uh, questions, time for questions from you, usually about eight o'clock or so we try to end it so you can um, still spend some time with with your family. Um, I don't know if I was introduced, um, but I'll tell you very quickly that I'm Dr. Josie. I'm a medical oncologist at UPMC. Um, At this time, however, I'm on um, medical leave, um, meaning usually I say that I can help you with all the things we're discussing here, just schedule an appointment with me, um, but that's not going to be able to happen for now um, because I'm on medical leave. So that's a little little caveat, um, but we'll, depending on what your needs are, maybe I can help you triage somewhere else. Um, my voice is also a little weird, which is for the same reason, um, uh, for for neurological reasons. So I, I hope you're okay listening to me um, this way, and then we'll just get started. Um, my topic is to talk with you about partnering with your medical team. Some of the challenges, some of the main things you need to pay attention to. Um, and I will focus on, do you see that the slide moved? It's a white slide now with five items. Okay, so these are the five essential elements of survivorship care um, that are recommended by uh, many organizations across the board. And um, they may seem very intuitive to you, but uh, believe it or not, um, these are not consistently addressed, which is why uh, we continue to raise awareness for it and make you Um, empower you to advocate for yourself. So one of the essential elements of follow-up care, um, once you've been diagnosed with cancer, is to perform surveillance, um, to um, monitor for health issues. Hold on one second. Peter, can you close the door, please? Thank you. Okay. So he's gone. Um, To watch for... um, recurrence of your um, previous cancer diagnosis. The next item is um, screening for new cancers. Um, Thirdly, assessing and managing post-treatment effects, um, health behaviors or lifestyle. And last but not least, the very confusing existence of coordinating your care, which can become a full-time job um, as a cancer survivor. And we'll go through each one of these five topics um, to touch on on it a little bit. And somebody here is snuggling a dog. Aww. <laughs> so why should we focus on the elements of care? Um, well, like I said, part of it is to empower you um, so that you feel more, um, um, I don't know, encouraged to talk with your healthcare team, um, to ask questions, to understand what they discuss with you. Um, One of the ways um, that you can help yourself um, when you interact with a team, whether that's through a virtual visit in person or an an, an message through a patient portal is is that you um, communicate in a way Um, so one thing we're doing here and the reason we're recording it, I'm just going to tell you, so I see your faces is we're updating the syllabus and the slides. And so we've reorganized everything a little bit. And the person who helps us is going to listen how I talk and adjust the slides again. And so, um, if it's a little rusty or not as smooth, um, that will be assigned to the person who helps helps me with slides. He's a healthcare provider and HIPAA compliant uh, to fix this. That's why we're recording it. So I don't think this is super smooth, but I'll um, smooth it out. When you talk with your healthcare providers, um, try to write things down, not right before your appointment, but 
all across because you think you will remember which symptoms and issues and problems you had um, every day, but you don't. And when the doctor asks you what happened with you, what were your side effects, how bad were they, how long did they last, how long were you able to stay in this medication, when did you need to stop it, you think you will remember, but the minute the provider opens the door, all that will somehow blink out. And so it's very helpful if you write it down, not just what you experience, but also the questions you have. And that will allow you to review whatever you've written down right before you go and see this person. And then you can maybe sort out the top three issues or questions you would like to address, because usually beyond three items, they won't have the time to, to talk with you about. Now, one of the things to note is you don't only have to ask your questions to the main provider, whether that is a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Sometimes you can ask the nurse or even the person who rooms you. Uh, many of these individuals know many of these answers too, and then you can divide and conquer a little bit and you feel like you're less um, a bother, which is the whole point of this conversation, that you are never a bother. All your questions are legitimate. And, and lastly, adherence is very, very important. Adherence to anything from what we tell you to do in terms of um, taking certain medications, but also your ability to continue to do health maintenance. Many of us are so focused on taking care of your cancer issues that you, you forget to do your regular health maintenance. Um, and so all of that is could bother you. And that's one of the reasons why um, we are here trying to make you feel less embarrassed, make you feel less um, ashamed or inadequate, but allow you to feel like, speak up, tell others what's on your mind, because if you tell us, we can help you. So the first item to talk about is surveillance, to watch um, a monitor for the recurrence of cancer, which is, by the way, the number one emotional concern that all of the cancer survivors have, and I'm pretty sure all of you here do too. Um, that's very scary. And in particular, as over time, we see you less. Um, we may see you less long. We may see you less often. We will stop doing less tests. And if you talk with your neighbors, friends, family members, you may discover that everybody seems to have a different testing schedule. And that can be sometimes very confusing and very scary. Even if you have the same tumor type, it sometimes seems like we're all doing different things. Some may do blood work, some don't. Some do scans, some don't. And so the whole, whole uh, reason I bring this up is that most likely whatever they tell you to do is appropriate for you. Um, but if you notice that somehow you're doing something different than somebody else, feel free to write that in your notebook and bring it up the next time so they can reassure you that you are doing what's right for you. Because even if you have the same tumor type, um, the cancer itself may have different individual characteristics that makes it less behaves differently, um, might be more or less aggressive. And you may have had different types of cancer therapies that require different surveillance. And therefore, most likely, everybody is getting recommended whatever they need to do, but it's never a bad thing to double check on it. Part of the confusing part is that there is no evidence guiding us in terms of what cancer survivors need to do in terms of surveillance testing. At some point in the past, somebody decided this is what we need to do every three months, every six months, every 12 months, but nobody really looked at whether that's the right thing to do. And we all know that some CT scans or um, radiology testing are associated with um, radiation exposure. Uh, doing a blood test is 
a nuisance as well. A lot of anxiety involved, sometimes a huge amount of co pace. And so we're trying to personalize it and evidence is starting to mount and tell us that we've been overdoing it for quite a bit. And so sometimes more is not always more, sometimes less is more. But then we're being asked to deal with uncertainty to a larger degree. Um, but then again, how long will a scan or a blood test give you peace of mind anyway? For a minute, for an hour, for a day, for a week? Um, nobody knows. And so there's a lot of uncertainty, which is, I think, the key point on this, on this slide. Another thing that many patients, I guess, survivors ask me is, who do I call when? And that's also a very tricky question because many of us don't want to feel like we're the boy who cries wolf. Um, and so the way I usually explain it is give you a framework so that you feel more comfortable um, calling us um, without Googling overnight. You know what's happening with your body, but you may not always know how to make sense of it. And that's why we're here. And so you can make a team with us, but we don't know what's bothering you. And so what I usually say is if you have non-acute symptoms, if you think your appendix burst or you had a stroke or a heart attack, please go to the emergency room. But if you don't feel like it's an acute thing, um, but it's um, either an old symptom, but now changed, or um, a new symptom that you've not had before, both, both of which the old symptom that's changed or the new symptom, both of which um, maybe are present for one or two weeks. At that point, I would say, call your provider, ideally cancer provider, because they feel more comfortable deciding whether it could be related to cancer or not. And then they will tell you one of three things. On the one end of the spectrum, they may say, this really doesn't sound like it's cancer related. Please call your primary care physician, PCP abbreviation, and have them figure out what it's from. Um, the other two options, um, one is totally on the other end of the spectrum. They may say, well, this sounds a little bit concerning. Why don't we do some tests like blood work or scans and have you come to the office and most likely everything will be clean. But what I see most common is that in-between scenario where you tell us symptoms that we can't make any sense of medically just yet. The symptoms are not specific for us to be able to diagnose it, to label it. And then we will give you supportive symptomatic therapies. If you have pain, we'll give you pain medications and we'll reevaluate things like a month later, at which point for the most part, the symptoms are gone, meaning it was not from cancer because it wouldn't have resolved on its own. And this framework may help you feel more comfortable when to call who, um, and then allow the provider you picked, you feel comfortable with, to guide you through um, what needs to be done. Do I make sense that you have this teamwork, a framework, you, you are not responsible for deciding and making sense of it? Okay, so next slide. Um, okay, we just went over this. The follow-up care is individualized. Um, so maintaining communication with your healthcare team, I think in this case, I'm preaching to the choir because usually individuals who are part of this course um, know this already, um, but most recurrences are <clears throat> detected in between follow-up visits. And it might be confusing, if not stressful for all of you to try to make sense of these little aches and pains you feel. And they might be scary. 
um, and first thing that goes through your head is, is my cancer back? And that's, that's why we just went through that slide to give you a little bit of a framework, how you can control the thoughts and feelings that are going through your body. The next essential element of care is screening for new cancer. Many, many patients ask me, okay, I had one cancer. What about any new cancers? <clears throat> and the answer is yes, you are at risk for developing any other cancer, just like any other person on the planet. Having had one cancer doesn't protect you from getting a second, which I say not to cause you to flip out, um, but I'm saying this because your your thoughts about this are um, appropriate. There's my my previous um, late mentor used to tell me there's three levels of care, risk for developing cancer. Um, the, there's the baseline population risk for anybody who's out there walking on the street. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum are those who have a known gene mutation. Their lifetime risk of developing cancer is reasonably high and we have a cookbook recipe for them in terms of what to do when to mitigate their risk. And then there is a huge area in between these two in which all of you pro probably fall um, once you have a diagnosis of cancer, your, your risk for a new cancer is higher than the population, but not as high as if you are a gene mutation carrier. And so what do we do for those individuals? The frustrating answer is that we don't know. This is one of those other fields of research that we really need to delve into. But the bottom line is that... Um, and this is another plug for your primary care doctor, that it's important for you to stay with your primary care doctor to make sure you're up to date with your age and gender uh, appropriate national cancer screening guidelines from your colonoscopy to your pop smear to your whatever else might be appropriate for you at whichever age and gender bracket you are. And not to underestimate the benefit of a skin exam. Your skin is the biggest organ in your whole body. And um, that's a relatively easy thing to do. It takes longer for you to park your car than for them to check your skin. Um, and then it just gives you peace of mind that you're doing as much as we can at the current time in the 21st century. Um, so I'm gonna go on to the next slide. So assessment and management of side effects is usually something I will get back to in the end um, if time allows us to do that. But I'm going to give you some general pointers right now. Um, and like I said, maybe at the end of the presentation, we can come back to some specific symptoms. Um, there are a huge... Um, how do I say that? The burden of post-treatment symptoms in survivors is large. Often these symptoms can be emotional, functional, physical, financial. Um, they often cluster. Once you have a symptom in one category, it often triggers other symptoms in the other categories that makes it very challenging sometimes to function at work, at home. Um, it can impact your quality of life. Sometimes some of my patients lost their job. And um, as you can understand, it triggers, it's a cascade of, of things that can happen. And in my opinion, I think it's very important that there is a shared decision-making between the provider and the patient because there's often a lack of cancer specific um, guidelines for symptom management. Meaning we have guidelines for, for example, hot flushes, um, but we don't necessarily have evidence-based guidelines for how to manage hot flushes in cancer patients. 
And so the way we manage symptoms in cancer survivors is um, somewhat um, um, empiric, empiric done based on um, us talking with the patient, offer different options and see what fits best with them. Um, what I mean with that is that um, we should find, I'm just very cryptic, I understand, but we should find a treatment that hits as many symptoms as we can so that we don't ask you to go out and pursue 10 different treatments for each symptom one. And ideally, a treatment that fits with who you are. And so some survivors don't want any more medications because they feel they've had enough medications in their body. And so they may want to pursue talk therapy or exercise or yoga or you name it. While others don't have the time nor the money for that because those things are often expensive and they may want to pop a pill and be done with it. And so there, there's a whole host of different treatment options for many of these symptoms. But it all depends on who you are and how it fits in your life to try to pursue a treatment pathway for your symptoms um, that works for you. And sometimes that involves referring out to other providers, such as a physical therapist, a talk therapist, um, and all of that in the context of, of again, adherence. Some of you now are being asked to be on long-term cancer treatments administered at home. And sometimes they give side effects. And if you can take your cancer treatment because you have side effects, then um, that really starts to hurt your psyche. You start to feel really um, uncomfortable. And so if there is a way we can help you tolerate your medication better, then we're improving your quality of life, but also your quantity of life, if I make sense. Okay, um, so here's some of the side effects. Some of them are um, noticeable. Some of them um, are asymptomatic. Um, they're not on here, but for example, loss of bone mass or the development of osteoporosis, you don't feel until you break a bone. Um, a heart attack, you may not feel that you're developing slowly over time, um, how do you call that? Clogging of your arteries, but you only notice it when you get a heart attack. Some of these symptoms start right away after treatment has started. Some of them may not come until later. Some of these symptoms may short, may last shortly. Others may last for a long time. And so it's a coming and going of a host of symptoms that again might be helpful if you keep track of them in sort of like a diary, whether in your phone or on a piece of paper. Um, because when you see your provider, you often don't remember. And it may help because you've sometimes no idea what questions they may ask. We'll, we'll get that back to this um, if time allows. Now, who should you call when? We've been through that. Okay. So health behaviors, lifestyle, that was the fourth topic, I think. Um, one of the things that I noticed that once somebody has been diagnosed with cancer, um, one of the ways they feel they can control things is if they change their lifestyle, how much they move, how much they eat, um, what they eat, um, how they sleep, um, and sometimes people overdo it and sometimes people underdo it. And I'm not kidding. Um, I've had some patients in my office who ate healthy up until they were diagnosed with cancer and said, I don't care anymore and lived on unhealthy food like pizza every day. Vice versa, people who didn't eat healthy um, got cancer and felt so guilty about that that they now lived on lettuce only, which obviously is not a way to live. And so it's for us to help you find that just right balance um, where we find your happy medium 
some of us might be marathon runners, but many of us, including me, I will never run a marathon. That's just not going to happen. And so we need to find that happy medium that fits with who you are, knowing that lifestyle is important, but it's not the only thing that determines your outcome. There's still so many things in the black box of our body that we don't understand that will trigger a possible cancer reoccurrence that I don't think you can ever tell yourself I did it to myself. I didn't live healthy enough. And that's why my cancer came back. Do I make sense? Okay. Um, so some of the ways to find this just right balance is you soul searching, figuring it out, try and error, but sometimes also working with somebody else, such as Jeanette, who you've been working with every week. Um, Balance the physical and emotional health. Don't only focus on one of these. Um, prioritize or reprioritize what's important in your life as a whole, but also when it relates to lifestyle. Identify what's most meaningful to you. Um, try new habits in smaller increments, knowing that something is better than nothing. Um, this is interesting. I should remove the 10 minute increments because a recent publication said that we don't need to have a minimum of 10 minutes anymore. Whatever you do, even if it's a two minutes at a time is beneficial. Uh, it used to be, there was a paper that showed that 10 minutes are important, but now whatever you do. So if you do what, 16 times two minutes, some kind of physical activity, you got 30 minutes of physical activity to document in whatever, you know, tracker you use. And keep in mind that it doesn't, if we talk about exercise, it doesn't have to be sport. It can be anything from um, cleaning the leaves on the street to cutting your grass to getting the groceries in the house. All of that takes the laundry. All of that is, is physical activity and it can be fun too like ballroom dancing or, I don't know, horse riding, whatever. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be monotonous. And you might be moving more in your life than you give yourself credit for. Um, nutrition is another thing that many people ask me. Is there one diet that is better than the other? And the short answer is we don't know. Because when you Google diet, I'm sure all of you have done that, and you will find an endless list of diet options. None of them have been compared head to head. And none of them have really been investigated um, at a thorough level, which is very hard to do. Because all your lifetime lifestyle activities are connected. And so it's really hard to do a study to only look at the effect of diet. So my answer to that is we don't know what is the best diet. I would recommend that you pursue moderation and variety. And variety, I mean, literally, um, don't eat the same vegetables and the same fruits shake it up a little bit, choose different colors so you're exposed to different vitamins and um, maybe also shake up the shops where you buy so they get it from different suppliers and your um, toxin exposures might be a little altered too. Um, the most evidence we have, if you would like to stick to one diet is the Mediterranean diet. Um, that's for the most part, but not solely, plant-based um, and that seems to be a wholesome diet that doesn't really omit a particular food group um, but for the most part don't spend money don't make it yourself difficult focus on moderation and variety or otherwise no claim nobody can claim anything beyond this supplements um in general, don't start taking them on your own unless your provider recommends them. Sometimes we check blood levels for B12, for vitamin D. And if we tell you to take them, I would say take them even over the counter or sometimes we prescribe so much that it needs to be prescription strength. 
Um, but anything else you take, and there's a lot out there, um, making use of the fact that all of us are desperate and want to try as much as we can to stay alive. Um, but these are other supplements that we don't recommend are not FDA regulated. And so they may benefit, but also may not. And they may harm. Um, actually, two publications and pretty um, high validated journals have indicated that a multivitamin intake is associated with a shorter lifespan. Now, I don't want you all to flip out and think you've hurt yourself because we still don't understand this. Is that because healthy people don't take multivitamins and so these people live shorter because their underlying disease becomes a problem? Or is it because these multivitamins have 100 plus supplements, it's supra therapeutic dosages, maybe with a carcinogenic filler around it? And who knows what it does when you put it in your body? We, we don't understand just yet. And so until you understand, I would say, and I should add it to the slides, um, try to get your vitamins from your diet. Do what you can, but don't over, overdo it. Um, so this is a slide series that are, are new. Um, if, if you have... If you're not, if you don't feel comfortable, let me say that way, to start exercise if you've never done it before, or to resume exercise if you didn't do it before because you're afraid of hurting your body, or if you feel like you've lost strength um, or stamina or um, balance, then sometimes you need to start. Um, exercise, if that's the word I use, under supervision. And here are some other examples of um, si symptoms or signs that tell you that you may need to start exercising under supervision if you have weakness, fatigue, trouble swallowing. Um, I think for all of you, this is pretty common sense, but um, we just like to be thorough. And then there's different types of supervisional people you can go to. The three listed here, speech therapy, physical therapy, and occupational therapy, they help you go back to your baseline, maybe your new baseline. Once you're back to your baseline, then somebody like Jeanette is a personal trainer can take over and get you towards even stronger than what your baseline is. She can maintain it and hopefully maybe grow it even stronger. But in the, in the active phase, when you feel like you've really lost a lot, um, any of these three specialties can help you get back to some baseline under supervision. And the one that's not listed here is exercise physiology. If any of you have been um, operated on your heart or your lung, um, then sometimes an exercise physiologist need to start with need to start exercising with you. They can keep a close eye on your heart and your lungs and make sure you don't you don't overdo it. Okay, next slide is for care coordination. Um, I had three slides for this, we condensed it to one, uh, but the bottom line is it can be highly overwhelming, highly uncertain, highly nerve wracking and expensive. And it can be a daytime job on its own. And all I'm trying to say here is balance things, you're not perfect. And no matter how busy your day is, try to carve out one thing, even if it's a small thing, to do something that gives you joy, a smile on your face. Every day, try to make it count, no matter how small of a smile, make a memory. It can be, I don't know, looking at TikTok videos, it can be calling your grandchild, it can be petting your pet, um, something 
that makes you feel like you're alive and not just a slave to all your to-do lists. I don't have the magical answer here, but I just wanted to make you feel you're not the only one. It doesn't mean you're not capable, you're not skilled, you're not good at managing your time. It can be really, really overwhelming. And one of the things that I didn't put on the slide is if you feel really overwhelmed, don't feel embarrassed to bring it up with your provider. They can look at your list and tell you, this can wait six months, this can wait a year, this you really need to do like yesterday. And that gives you a better feeling of, okay, now I know what goes first and second and third. Um, because everything at once is just sometimes too much. Um, how to find information on the internet. I think the bottom line is, um, ask us for any particular materials. We have printed materials in the office or websites. Um, look for web addresses that end on .gov.edu or .org. The exception to that is the website by the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is our professional organization. They have a patient counterpart that is cancer.net. It's the only organization that has valid information that ends not on any of these three extensions. But preferably, I would say, stay away from Google. And I'm not kidding. I had a patient come in once with hundreds, I don't know how thick this pack is, of printed materials that were um, from an online source that was written by a veterinarian who thought he had knowledge in the field because his wife was undergoing treatment for cancer. And a lot of what he wrote was perfectly right on, but a lot was not. And so don't assume that anything that's out there is, is appropriate, even if they call themselves a doctor. So this is maybe a question we can um, do interactive if you would like to, um, and maybe we should save when the recording is done. What do you do when well-meaning friends and family um, give you unsolicited medical advice or they call you at 11 p.m. before you're ready to go to bed with the latest and greatest news flash that there is a new treatment that has come out just when you finish your treatment? or they find a new side effect of a treatment that you were on. It's very unnerving. And what, what do you do? Um, I'm pretty sure all of you have been through that to some degree. Um, for the most part, these are helpful suggestions of people who really wanna do anything they can to help you. Um, and you can thank them, uh, but you don't have to keep talking about it. You don't have to pursue it. If it starts bothering you in the back of your head, know that whatever is announced on the news is, is either usually very premature, meaning it's discovered in a research trial and is not ready for prime time yet, or um, if they find it, after a treatment has already been approved, that's usually a very small chance of it happening. Because if there was a big chance of it happening, we would have picked it up already in big studies that we had done before. And unfortunately, the field, the cancer field is a field that is turning over very quickly in terms of studies and new treatments coming out. And that benefits you here in the 21st century um, you're getting much better treatment than individuals were getting even 10 years ago. But it also means that 10 years from now, people are getting better treatment than what you're getting. And sometimes that means that less treatment is more than more treatments. We're discovering that sometimes we've been overdoing it a little bit and you pay the price with post-treatment issues. Um, and so... I want you to be prepared and feel comfortable to say thank you, but I don't want to hear this right now. I can't hear this right now. And similarly, once you've gone through this, people think you're an expert and they may ask you, hey, 
can you help me? Or can you help my neighbor's friends? Because they've just been newly diagnosed with cancer. And sometimes you may really enjoy paying it forward. Sometimes your mindset is just not in the right place. And that's okay. Just be honest and say, I would like to help, but I can't do it right now. Is if you're not in the right mindset, you're, you're hurting both the other person and you. And that's okay. You figure it out. The other people will figure it out too. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, so this slide should be moved earlier on. We've already been through this. Oh, but ask somebody to come with you. You might all think that you're an adult and you can do this on your own, but it's sometimes really nice to have a buddy with you who, you know, really gets you um, for emotional support, but also an extra set of ears. Nothing weak about taking somebody with you. Making every day count. We've already been over this. And this is Jeanette. So let's go back to this slide with symptoms and let's make it interactive. So I am going to stop sharing. And I don't know if it's recorded or is it already turned off?